Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. I'm your co-host Lolita, also joined by Kyle. Listeners, are you an entrepreneur or a business leader trying to achieve new heights? Or has it ever crossed your mind that being an author or writing a book would give you great credibility in your desired industry? If so, you'll want to stay tuned for today's interview with Nick Rathel. Nick, welcome to the show. How's it going? Great to be here, Lolita and Kyle. Really looking forward to sharing insights on the show. Awesome. Well, welcome to our show. Here we go. Nick is the creator of the seven hour book. This proven system allows any individual to get their own professionally published book while spending only seven hours of their time on it. With the seven hour book, Nick is on a mission to help peak performers in business finally get the recognition they deserve. So I find this incredible and maybe almost too good to be true. So Nick, let's get started by telling the, li- the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Certainly. So as you noted in the introduction, I am the creator of the seven hour book. And with this system, my team and I are helping individuals, entrepreneurs, people in real estate and other folks to build really a platform for themselves to in the case of real estate investing, attract people to their deals. In the case of entrepreneurship, to really get out there, become a thought leader, to further develop their credibility on that front. And relating back to what exactly the seven hour book is, it's a system where the people we're working with spend a grand total of seven hours of their time talking to us via Zoom, via Skype, other channels like that. And we then, on our side, are putting the book together for them, designing it in a way that is going to help them to achieve their particular goals. Very cool. Awesome. Thanks for that. And so obviously, this is a little bit off topic because we're a real estate related show. But I do think that this relates to a lot of people because real estate investors are entrepreneurs. And I think that writing a book can be very beneficial. So I'm really interested in getting into this conversation. So first of all, why would someone want to write a book? Well, that's a great question, and it definitely ties into what you were just saying about this seeming to be a little bit off topic. In terms of answering that, why would someone want to write a book, and someone particularly in real estate investing? One of the things that comes to mind is the fact that the media space right now, in particular, around real estate investing is becoming quite crowded. I mean, you go on iTunes, for example, type in real estate, And you're probably going to be scrolling through quite a few listings beyond that for a while. A lot of people have tapped into that and are realizing that podcasting, that YouTube series, things like that are an excellent way to get out there, particularly if you're raising capital, to bring on people who have credibility or are experts in various fields, leverage off their credibility if you're just starting out. Or if you're an expert and you've been in the game for a while, convey your own expertise that space getting very crowded. There are other channels too that have long, long before been crowded, Twitter, Facebook, anything like that. What isn't as crowded though is those media spaces where you have to put in a little bit more work or even a lot of work. I'm not saying podcast isn't a lot of work. I'm not saying YouTube show or channel isn't a lot of work. But it's certainly been work. But in terms of those older channels, in particular, books, any kind of printed media, and even events, those areas and those avenues for reaching people are a lot less crowded because there's more work involved. And that's really where a book comes in. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that explanation. So talk, talk to us a little bit about what the seven-hour book is. You, you hit on it briefly, but how did that come that, how did that process come to being? It's really the marriage, in a sense, of two different, two different currents that I've long been fascinated with, and I know a lot of other people have as well. One of those currents being books. I mean, there's something, something just indescribable about picking up a book, being able to physically touch it, or even in the case of ebooks, having this having this experience of reading through someone else's thoughts, really getting a window into their mind in terms of what they're thinking, what their ideas are, how they think, period. And books have always fascinated me in that respect. And I would imagine I'm certainly not the only one. So books 
not only being a window into someone else's mind, but also being a vehicle and a lever to allow you, the reader, to find your own new insights. Whether that's reading a book like Rich Dad, Poor Dad and realizing, wow, the way I see money is completely off in some cases, or reading a book like The 4-Hour Workweek and realizing in that sense, there's a whole nother ball game out there that I could be playing. So an interest in books along those lines, coupled with the other current being a fascination with productivity. Productivity, time management, getting things done in a more efficient way, putting those two together and putting them together for the simple reason that many people out there would like to write a book. And I've heard this more times than I can count. They would like to write a book, but the issue always seems to be you just don't have time. So when you take that as your premise and you look at how you can take time management and merge that into the book version process, that's really where the seven hour book comes from. Okay, great. And so how does the process work exactly? You mentioned you have seven one hour calls with your team and the and book gets put together, but I'm sure there's more on the back end that, that goes along with that. And so can you take us through maybe the process or the breakdown of how that seven hours is spent and then how a book is created from those seven hours? Absolutely. To give you and your listeners a sense of what we're doing exactly, we try to divide the structure of the book in such a way that it can be evenly done over those seven calls. So I'll give you guys an example. Let's say we're working with a multifamily syndicator. We've actually worked with quite a few of those guys and gals. And the goal of their book is to show investors and would-be investors that they're credible, they know what they're doing, and they may even have done this quite a few times before. In their case, the way we might structure the book would be as in certainly an authority building piece, but it's an authority building piece through, say, five core principles or even four core principles, a set of core principles. And if we were doing it along those five core principles, then we would start off the first call would be focusing on the introduction to the book. And that might be where the investor, the syndicator we were working with would share his story or her story of how they got into it and why they believe that multifamily investing is an excellent channel for building wealth and for achieving financial freedom. And in those middle calls, numbers two through six, we would be going into one of the core principles or core pillars that the investor behind the book wish to convey to their passive investors and would-be passive investors. So one of those pillars might be what I look at when I'm doing my due diligence. How fees are typically structured when you're passively investing in a multifamily deal. Other things might be what makes a good deal in the first place. I mean, that's certainly something you're going to want to let your passive investors know how you think regarding the deals that you're going to be putting their money into. So those would form the middle five or the, the five core pillars in the center of this whole seven hour book process. And then at the end on that last call, number seven, we'd be looking at the conclusion. We would also be getting into things like marketing, things like design of the book cover, those sort of things on that last call. That's really how the seven hour process fits together. Okay. Awesome. So how can your teams write books on a specific subject when they're not experts in that given industry? Is there a learning curve? Because obviously there's a piece of it that is going to rely on the people writing the book uh, on behalf of the person that you're talking to, to make a finished kind of polished product. Certainly. Well, in that respect, you're right. I mean, not being multifamily investors per se, there definitely is that learning curve. I will say something on that though that one of the things that helps with this is the fact that more often than not the people who are reading the book are not looking for a textbook and they're not looking for something that is hyper specific with terminology and going very deep in most cases if not all 
the people who are reading the book, the intended audience, they're just looking for basic knowledge. And in some cases, where the person we're doing the book for is much more in the lifestyle design and, say, financial freedom direction, the book is even less technical than that. It's more like, here's multifamily or here's turnkey investing. And it's more story-based, actually. The story being thrust of the book, how this person the investor achieved their goals and oh by the way i did that through multifamily or oh by the way i did that through turnkey so in that case, it's even less specific even less of a learning curve okay yep and so tell us the difference between hiring let's say a ghost writer and then hiring your firm to write a book what's the biggest difference here that's a very good question in terms of the difference a ghost writer and no you know no disrespect to them they're in a, English majors even are going to be much more focused on, or they tend to be much more focused on wordplay and making something sound witty and clever and getting people to laugh, for example, or to smile, chuckle. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, the way we're looking at it is from a marketing focus and from an ROI and a goals focus. How is this book going to move the needle? In your business, how is this book going to resonate with the right kinds of people, the right kinds of passive investors, the right kinds of potential coaching students? And that's another one. If you're saying flipping or you're doing something, a lot of those guys go into coaching, and the book can be a really good avenue for them to launch their coaching program. So, in that case, how is this book going to attract your prospective coaching students, uh, people who are looking to do speaking games? I was just going to, in some cases, chapters that are structured form the basis for keynotes of some of the channel. So let's say you had seven or five, in some cases, core messages that you put in your book. Those five core messages could then become one of your keynotes. So people reading the book, you would send this to conference organizers. Conference organizers reading the book would then see or they might be able to see or you could prompt them that hey this chapter would make an excellent keynote i think of this other chapter might be at this conference so that really is designing the book with the end in mind and how it's going to move you forward wow yeah i love that that's awesome okay so you touched on this a little bit but how does your team go about pulling out the best of what the person kind of has to offer and making sure the content being written is is valuable and can position, let's just say me, for example, uh, to be an expert in their field. You know, I think a lot of people, when they first start writing out a book, they may have that doubt in the back of their mind, you know, should I even be writing a book? Am I qualified to write a book? It's kind of like anything when you first get started. So how do you go about pulling the best out of everyone? We have a very targeted system by which we focus our questions. I mean, the questions that we ask and the discussions we have on those calls while we do have some basic templates that we use, we significantly customize them to make sure that the things that we're talking about are just for that person. So we're not going to be asking too much generic stuff that just vaguely, vaguely gets insights. You know, if someone has said in the past, and we know, for example, that they got their start flipping houses, but then realized that multifamily was a lot better, we're going to be talking specifically about that. Or if someone says, for example, that when we know that they had a bad experience with the guru, we're going to be bringing that up on the calls. And in some cases, that's actually a pretty good angle for someone to take in a book. Just to go off on a little tangent here, in terms of book ideas, if you want to have kind of a, a ready-made idea or thrust for a book, one of them could be that you're you've seen it all or you're sick of the guru lies, so to speak, and you're writing your book as kind of an answer to that to show people the truth. Just put an idea out there for our listeners who might be considering to write a book. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And how many pages in general are these books uh, that were being created? Are they all very similar, 100, 125 pages, or do they vary based on the person and the industry? They can vary. I will say that what we've found in the case of, let's just say real estate, 
this sweet spot is usually about maybe 120 to about 170 pages. I mean, this is not um, this is not War and Peace. This is not a Harry Potter novel or anything like that. Yep. Yep. Okay. And so, what does your perfect customer look like for the type of books that you're creating? That's a good question. Our perfect customer, or ideal, is probably along the lines of someone who is in real estate, real estate investing, uh, is serious about it. It's, it's not just doing a house hack for better or worse, and uh, has definitely has experience. And is looking to get somewhere, whether that's get somewhere to a new height, basically going back to what Lolita you were saying about reaching new heights is looking to reach new heights in some direction, whether that's launching a coaching program, whether that's raising capital aggressively for more deals, whether that's getting more speaking engagements, or just becoming overall more credible. And I would add a big component to all of this on top of that is that they've thought through books and other media. And they've decided that books in particular, make the most sense. And I say that because plenty of people can get it in their mind that, oh, I should do a book. But sadly, in some instances, they just haven't thought it through all the way as to whether a book specifically is going to help them achieve their goals. And it would only take a moment to stop and to think and to look at all of the other potential media channels for them, whether that's doubling down on Instagram, whether that's launching a podcast, whether that's doubling down on Facebook, or just even taking time to go to more meetings. They take time overall to look at those options and realize they have those options in the first place. They might come to a different conclusion regarding them. But I just want to get that out there because part of our ideal customer, as you were referencing, part of that is people who have thought through and know for a fact that a book makes sense for them. Yep. yep. Great advice there. Do you also help with any type of positioning as far as marketing? I know you go through the process and make sure that the book positions itself, but what do you do afterwards? You know, how do you get the book out there? Um, because just writing a book is not going to be enough. You need to promote it and get it in the hands of other people. So do you help with that at all? We absolutely do. Yeah. And I would say for our listeners, actually, to give them some something actionable right now, if you're thinking about books or this, this, any media like this, one of the biggest things that we find that really helps a book get out there is reviews. I mean, reviews are something that makes or breaks products online and books are really no different. So anyone who's thinking about a book or even gotten to the point where they have a book out there, I would say one of the things that's really going to help your book to spread is the more reviews you get. Because not only getting reviews, but the people who write the reviews then are going to be talking about the book to other people. Yeah. Uh, that, and also uh, another thing that really helps with books that plenty of people do and we help people with as well is the free plus shipping offer. So where you have the book, let's say, on your website, and people can pay just for the shipping, but use that to get their emails or their email list or their little database answers. Okay. And are there any additional fees? You're, you mentioned shipping costs there that you can pass on to the customer, but what other fees are associated with launching your book? How much does it cost if you want to do printed versions versus you know, an ebook? That's really going to depend. I mean, I know that an ebook, just because it's not physical, uh, the costs are going to be substantially lower, and if not free in some cases. Um, but it really just varies from person to person. Okay. Uh, any other fees that you charge other than your, you know, your full seven hours? Is it a flat fee? How does how does your fee structure work? Sure. So our fee is a flat fee, and it's split out into installments. Okay. Perfect. What percentage of your customers actually turn this book into a profitable asset, meaning by selling it for, let's just say, nineteen ninety nine and making money off that versus using it more as a marketing and branding tool? I think that the majority of the people we're working with are using it specifically for that marketing and credibility tool. 
I mean, I, I, I really can't recall the last time I talked with someone or one of my colleagues talked with someone where the person was specifically looking to create an info product empire and to really get rich off of these books. I mean, because it's, you look at the industry and most writers and most book, most people who put out books, you know, they might make some money off it, but they're certainly not becoming New York Times bestsellers or anyone like that, anything like that. And apart from, apart from the credibility and the authority that they get, financial actual book isn't there yep okay yeah more about building credibility for sure how many books has your uh company written for other uh, entrepreneurs and real estate investors out there that's a great question i would i would say too many <laughs> okay it's i've actually lost count okay awesome lalita is going to take us into our final four questions are you ready absolutely let's do it all right nick what is the one tool you use when writing your books that you cannot do without? I would say Trello. And the, if people haven't heard of Trello, it's a system, web-based application, that allows you to create what they call boards. And a board is really like having, if you think about it old school, one of those boards, I think it was made of cork back in the old mm -hmm. days, where you'd have your little tacks and you'd tack up cards and be able to organize your cards around. And Trello takes that and applies that to a digital format with being an application. So when we're creating books, that allows us really to organize the flow of, of particular chapters, ideas we want to work in, and also help the authors we're working with to organize where we are in the project and what's coming next. Awesome. Can you tell us a story maybe about the most bizarre book you've asked, you've been asked to write? Yeah, I, I don't want to mention the name, uh, but it was, and they'll know if they're listening, but <laughs> it was, uh, it was actually going to be entirely fictional, which is really something we don't cross into mm -hmm. too much, if ever, but it, it was going to be fictional, but also applicable to entrepreneurship and it was uh, sort of a takeoff on the richest man in Babylon in that it was going to be an anthology of different characters but it was set centuries ago I believe the guy wanted it to be in the middle ages and it sort of incorporated the princess bride and <laughs> got kind of weird from there <laughs> but I would I would say that's probably the weirdest <laughs> All right. uh, what is it that you need to do now to grow your life to the next level I would say on that, get better at hiring uh, and finding the right people and qualifying the right people uh, because it's, as the saying goes, it's easier to, uh, easier to hire than to fire and really being able to spot and find the right talent because we know we've got, but that process of finding them and onboarding them is just I almost feel like it's one of those things that you can never really master and you always have to continually improve. So I'm focused on that continual improvement. Awesome. And finally, where can people find out more about you? Sure. They can go to our website, contentcore.net, and that's spelled C-O-N-T-E-N-T-C-O-R-P-S dot net, N-E-T, contentcore.net. Great interview. You provide such an amazing resource. I have a feeling quite a few of our listeners may be reaching out to you after listening to this. So we appreciate your time, Nick, and thanks for being on our show. Thank you again for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Nick.